Okay, welcome to our weekly confirmation class. This is Reverend Phil Anderson, pastor of Oakland United Methodist Church and Kansas Avenue United Methodist Church, welcoming you to our class here on the evening of February 11th, 2021. I hope whatever you're doing, you're having a good day, that you're staying safe, and most importantly, that you're staying warm. It's still awfully cold out, isn't it? It's been a cold week. Kind of been in the deep freeze here as I have found it here the last few days. So, you know, we hope you're doing well. And if you're watching this live, we appreciate you joining us here on Facebook Live. And if you are joining us a little later on our Facebook page, welcome as well. We're just glad to have you with us one way or the other. You know, we're doing this confirmation class. I know some of you have been with me every time and would much rather do it maybe on a Zoom platform and also maybe preferably even get together in person, but it's just, this is this is about as good as we can do right now. Hopefully before too long, we'll be able to maybe try to branch out into the Zoom platform. I was talking to someone just last night from Kansas Avenue Church, and we were discussing different ways to even hold a business meeting, administrative council. We haven't had one of those since November. It's amazing how many Things just keep flowing right along, though. People are still supporting the churches, for which we're very grateful. The work of the churches behind the scenes continues. We have people who are paying the bills. They are taking care of the building, making sure the pipes haven't frozen, things like that. They're just keeping an eye on things. And we also have the prayer warriors, those that are praying for the church. I even know of a number of people who are making those daily phone calls to make sure people are okay. I've called a lot of different people this week and talked to them about how they're doing and some of their needs. And, you know, it's amazing the needs that are out there, especially for some of our older friends. And so just be mindful that we can still be in touch with them even though we don't see each other quite as frequently here during the virus so again i would highly encourage you to make phone calls to people send them a note send them a text message an email whatever they like it needs to be on their terms not on ours right so that they will actually receive it and then that they would really know that we care about them like i told you last sunday i can't do it all so i really do need the help of everybody to come on beside me to help reach out to those right now that we're just having a hard time getting in touch with. I know at least one person was in the hospital this week from the Oakland Church. We want to keep people in prayer. We've got coronavirus cases going on, at least one that I know of, and maybe another one has just kind of resolved here recently. And you know, these are things that are real. They're going on in our churches. We don't just hear about them on television, read about them in our different media, but we really know these are actual people. We know a lot of them, and so we really want to lift them up in prayer. So, again, there's reasons, again, why we're not meeting in person right now. And I did hear the report card this afternoon. It sounds like it's creeping down a little bit further into that orange category, which is good. We want it to move down. We want that needle to go from the red over to the orange. And once it gets in the yellow, I think we'll be starting to have some discussions about when we're going to get back together now. Just because it hits the old doesn't mean we're getting right back. It just means we're going to start having those discussions, and it needs to stay there for a while. You know, the past history has been when we've started to see some good news. Everybody's just kind of, oh, let's celebrate. Let's get together. And then the, the needle just goes right back over to the red. So we're going to be mindful of everything as much as we can, certainly. We're going to be careful. I would much rather be talking to folks around a table tonight and maybe having a cup of coffee or tea and just having a nice visit as well as our Bible studies. A year ago at this time, we were having our Bible studies. We were still meeting Thursday nights and we would meet up in the pastor study there, at the Oakland church and Michelle and Ryan would be in there making the bulletins for the Sunday service. And a lot of times uh, Linda and uh, Ralph would come in and sit down and we'd have our Bible study. Michelle and Ron would join me quite frequently and sometimes other people would, would pop in. So we really had a nice little thing going. It was small, but it was good, you know, and that's really where we get to know each other is the small groups. And so hopefully when we do get back together, that will continue and we'd just like to see that grow. You know, maybe you feel like you'd like to 
be a host of a small group. Maybe you'd like to have people come to your place or you'd like to lead one at the church. So just be thinking about that. The, the thing I really have noticed through the last couple, three weeks has been that I really want to equip the members for ministry. I really want to let them know how important they are to the overall ministry of the church. You know, small churches have ministries just like big churches. We don't need to sit there and apologize for being small. I mean, I'd like to see us grow. I think we all would like to see us grow. But that's going to happen one person at a time. In the meantime, we just need to be faithful and obedient to what God's telling us to do. And he'll take care of the rest. But we, we have to take care of what he's telling us to do, right? So that's a part of the plan. You know, I sat down, I think I may have mentioned this too on Sunday how I sat down and I wrote a bunch of goals and visions out, which is great. I think I need to do that as the pastor and the minister of the churches. And later I thought about that, even later that day, I thought, man, I'm glad I didn't send that out because I think really that was more for me to just kind of get an idea. I might share that at some point, but it was almost overwhelming when I looked at it. It, was, it would be, a, it would be a, a difficult task. Some of the things I had on there would be a challenge even for a church of 300 people. So and yet I dream big when I dream. I don't dream small, God, God, God's uh, willing. I try to trust God for the big things. I, I, don't have, I don't serve a small God. I serve a big God. He's got potential way beyond what I can even dream. So I just put it in his hands and, I, and I'm you know, just reaching for the stars with him. So I, I hope that's the way our churches will look at things. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's both right now kind of just surviving the COVID. And then once we get out of that, I really hope that we're going to be ready to rock and roll. We're going to really get some of these ministries off the ground. So that's all in the way of preliminaries for us. That was kind of a long preliminary, but I just there's just not a lot of chances to even touch bases with people right now in terms of just talking about things like this. You know, on Sunday mornings at 1030, we usually go pretty much right into the service. Sunday school hours when we can do a little more of this, you know, from 945 to 1015, 1020. But I don't think near as many people come on board for Sunday school as they do for the the church or the worship service at 1030. So, you know, whenever I get a chance anymore, I'm just trying to let people know this is what's going on. I know there are people. I hear it every time I talk to them. Like, when are we going to get back together again? And I mean, it, it, your guess is as good as mine. I, I think we will do the right thing, God willing. We'll use our wisdom. We'll use caution and We'll use all the information that we can get. Just as we have since March the 15th of 2020, so almost a year now. We've, I think we've only met like four months during, during that time frame. But you know what? Those were good four months, and we're going to make the best of this too. And God willing, we will be back together soon. That's probably all I can tell people. I hope it's soon. So tonight, let's have a word of prayer as we start. Father, I thank you for those that are watching, those that are going to come on later to watch this. And Lord, I just want, right now, I want to lift up those in our church family that need your touch. I know there are some who are battling health issues today and this evening. Lord, I pray you, you would, uh, that your touch would be upon them, that you would provide your own divine healing for them, Lord, that your touch would be noticeable. And Lord, I also pray you would work through the medical professionals, the doctors, the nurses, the physical therapists, whoever it might be, Lord, the counselors, the psychologists, anybody, Lord, just the you know anybody, Lord, that you would put in their path to help them, Lord, just touch these dear people, Lord, and the ways that only you can bring them back to complete and whole health. And we pray this in Jesus' name. You know, I like to thank God, too, for all he's done. And so I do I do thank the Lord for the blessings he's given us in spite of the challenges. And I never want to forget that. Every day is a day that we want to come into his presence. Into The Bible says, let us enter his courts with thanksgiving. So we want to enter his courts with thanksgiving and praise every day. And, and I believe God honors that. I've, I've got a story, but I think I'm going to wait and use it on Sunday. There was something that happened uh, Tuesday and then it carried over to Wednesday. And I think it's going to fit right in with our sermon this coming Sunday. So I'm going to share this phenomenal story with you on, on Sunday. And I think it'll be a blessing to you. And also, I have a special guest lined up. I'm not sure when we're going to start doing these uh, virtual uh, get-togethers, maybe during Lent. We may be doing uh, Wednesday night Lenten services. I don't believe we're going to do an Ash Wednesday program. I've already 
tried all kinds of different things that I don't think any of them are really going to work, especially with it being as cold as it is. I'd even thought about doing a drive through where we would hand people a little communion cup with ashes and let them put their own ashes on. Now, I didn't see anybody else come up with that idea, but, but I thought that would be a, a possibility. And even then, we're violating our social distancing to even hand it to somebody unless we put it on a table. They get out of their car and they get it. And I just don't think that's really worth the effort, to be honest with you, as much as I would like to start our Lenten season with an Ash Wednesday service, certainly. So we'll try to do something on Ash Wednesday. So do be watching for that. We'll do something probably virtually. And again, I may start with my guest on that night. I've already talked to him. I think he's willing to come along and help. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I know he'll be a blessing to you. So we'll, we'll, if we can do that, uh, if he can come on, we'll have a special guest. If not, we'll just go ahead and do our Ash Wednesday service a week from last night on February 17th, probably right around 6 o'clock. Okay, so today's confirmation topic is going to look at the aspect, again, of the law and the gospel. You know, that's really a key component to our understanding, I think, of, of the Bible and of our faith. And I'm, again, I don't come to you as some theologian or some Bible scholar. I'm coming to you as a person who loves the Lord, who loves God's Word, who believes it to be the way, the truth, the life. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that He is our Savior, if we will just receive Him, and that He will forgive us of our sins, and He'll give us that reconciliation with God the Father. So, And then the Holy Spirit is our gift to lead us and to guide us now. So I believe we have all of that going on when we embrace Jesus Christ into our hearts and into our lives. And again, we've talked about the importance of the Scripture and how when we read the Scripture, when we have the Lord in our hearts, when we have the Holy Spirit with us, it's going to illuminate it in such a way that we're just going to get this profound understanding, I believe, not only of the Bible, but of just life itself. And I think one of the key components of our faith is this whole idea of the law and the gospel. Or we could just say the law and grace. And Paul talks a lot about that in Galatians and talks about in Hebrews. Just this whole idea of what does it mean to truly be saved? What does it mean to be forgiven? And what do we have to do to have that right relationship with God that sin destroyed, restored? And so it's all about the grace of God that it was shown to us through the coming and the, uh, the, the life and the, and the death and the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was all brought into focus and into reality through Jesus Christ. So, so before we had the law, which was, again, those Old Testament rules that taught us so much about who God is and, and what he expects and his standards and how he cannot tolerate sin and disobedience. We, we already know all that through the Old Testament. Jesus came now as a fulfillment of all the prophecies in the Old Testament, some 300 prophecies that Jesus Christ fulfilled when he came as the Son of God to save us from our sins. And the, the key component here, if I can just say this right now, is that we are saved by grace. And that is initiated by God. So God initiated that to us. That while we were still sinners, that's when Christ came and died for us. He didn't wait for us to clean up our act. He didn't wait for us to be better people. He didn't expect us to perform a certain number of requirements or things that were maybe good for us to do that you would not, now I might think, well, we should do these things to, just to show them how much we love it. But God didn't ask us to do any of those. He just came to us just as we are. Remember the old song that the Billy Graham Crusades used to use as people would come forward. It was just as I am without one plea. You know, we don't, we don't have anything to offer God. He offers it to us through Jesus Christ. So, the law teaches what we are to do and not to do. And of course, the most famous of those laws are the Ten Commandments. And we've, we've talked a little bit about those. The Ten Commandments are, are critical as far as just giving us this picture of who God is. The gospel teaches us what God has done and still does in Jesus for our, our 
salvation. And again, I'm reading this, some of this from the Catechism app from the Concordia Publishing House. It's a Lutheran publishing house, but I believe it fits in well with what we are teaching here in our confirmation class here right now. Again, this confirmation class right now doesn't have an actual book, so we're just sort of putting different things together, sort of synthesizing materials from different sources as we get them. So, that being said, we have the law on one side and we have grace on the other. To me, those are the key differences. And if we don't understand what grace is, we're always going to be beating our head against the wall when it comes to our relationship with God, I believe, because we're always going to be trying, trying, trying to earn God's love, to earn his forgiveness, to earn his, just his goodness. And that's not how it works. Jesus Christ completed all of that on the cross. When he died on the cross, it was finished. And now all we have to do is to receive that by faith. So that's the grace that God sent Jesus down to be our sacrifice for our sins. And that by believing in him now, we have that assurance of salvation, of, of being forgiven. It's a great feeling, isn't it, to be forgiven? Have you ever done something and, and you wonder, man, I hate to tell somebody this, but I'm going to go ahead and tell them. I know they're probably going to be mad at me. And they may never talk to me again. And then they say, you know what, I forgive you, man. You know, sorry. I, I know you're sorry, you know. Well, that's what God does for us. He, he forgives us. He doesn't ever hold it over our heads. He forgives us, and then he forgets about what it was that we did. And so, as we've said before, really the biggest problem for a lot of us Christians is we never understood that grace covered it all. Yes, we do continue to struggle with our sin nature. It's that civil war that's going on that Romans 7 talks about, <clears throat> where Paul says, the very things I want to do, I don't do. The very things I don't want to do, I end up doing. Oh, what a wretched man that I am. And then in, in Romans 8, he says, thanks be to God who saved me from all of this unrighteousness. So, so we have, now we have the righteousness of Jesus Christ given to us by faith of, in Christ, because Christ took our sins upon himself when he died on the cross as fully God, fully man, and he gave us his righteousness in return. We don't do anything to earn it. We don't deserve it. We can't work for it. It's just given to us as a free gift. And I think that's the hardest part for Christians and really for non-Christians to understand is that it's a free gift. It's almost too good to be true. You know, you've always heard that top that saying, if it sounds too good to be true, well, it probably is. Well, in this case, it's not because it is true. It is a totally free gift. I shared with you all about a year ago in one of our services about a friend of mine who sent me a message and he told me about his son-in-law who he said was very close to receiving the Lord. Now, I imagine my friend had been praying for this person for years and this person apparently was right on the verge of coming to faith in Christ. But there was one problem, he said, that he had to overcome. And that was that, that this individual, this, this other person, could not believe that God would forgive him for everything that he had done. Isn't that something? You know, people really do realize, I think, at some point, the things that they've done have been displeasing to God. Well, I, I will take this. I think that's a great place to start because it's reality. We have done a lot of things that have been displeasing to God. I know I've probably displeased God more than most, and I'm sure I've hurt other people along the way, for which I'm always, to this day, very sorrowful for if I've ever done anything to hurt somebody or to offend somebody, and I'm sure I have. You know, you cannot go back and undo those things that you did. Now, you can ask for forgiveness. You can try to own up for it, but you still did it, you know, and I still did it. I guess that's really what I'm talking about. I'm looking at myself here more than anybody, and all we can hope for is that they'll forgive us. Now, if they don't, that's their choice, but <clears throat> by the same token, we need to be people who forgive others as well. And so that same grace that we were given, which was not earned by us, we did not deserve it, but we received it. Now we need to, re to extend that same grace to other people. And that's what Christ wants us to do as we share his love with other people, is to show them the goodness and the love and the forgiveness of God. And we're going to maybe be the only gospel they're going to read, at least for a while. I know I say this all the time, but it's the truth. And if we if we aren't careful in how we present ourselves, it's it's not going to be a good witness to people. You know, they 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 may write us off. They may say, "Well, this guy says he's a Christian. That's how he acts." You know, I don't want a part of a Christian Christianity or being in church if that's the way they act. You know, 
And, and I can understand that, honestly. I really can. The biggest issue, I think, for a lot of us is we feel they need to stand up for ourselves or stand up for others and, you know, maybe have confrontations with folks. And maybe there are some that are unavoidable. I'm not saying that there aren't some confrontations that are are maybe needed, but I don't think they need to be done maybe as often as what a lot of us think. And perhaps if we would give it a little bit of time to think about it, we would be able to smooth things down and keep the lines of communication open, keep that relationship with the other person going. It's more important to keep that relationship going than it is to go ahead and just say what I need to say and get it off my chest and then have this relationship kind of crumble or have it frayed or have it come apart. I was reading something today about wisdom and one of the little pithy quotes that it was, wisdom is the person who is wise is the one who doesn't say all the things he wanted to say, you know? And, and I really believe as he, as he looks back over his life, the wise person is the one who didn't say all the things that he really wanted to say. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I believe that's really true for a lot of us. And, you know, I, I've said this before and I, again, I'm repeating myself, so bear with me, but I really believe that if we don't say something, it's hard to go back. It's, it's almost impossible to ask forgiveness from somebody else for something that we never said to him, you know, especially if it was in the heat of the moment and we wanted to say something, maybe get our two cents in, maybe defend ourselves, maybe give a rebuttal and just think how our country would be different if we all forgave each other. You know, I'm serious. We, we, we have a, a, our culture, our society, and I'm not just talking about the highest levels. I'm talking about down to individuals where people are so quick to, just go off on somebody else. They're so quick to strike back at somebody. They don't even know what maybe that person went through. You know, and, may, and maybe they're justified in doing that. But you know what? God was patient with me, and now I need to be patient with other people as much as possible. So, so that's the grace. That's why the grace to me is the key. We know the law. The law is great. There's nothing wrong with the law, but the law didn't come to save us. The law came to point us to our need for a savior. The law in and of itself was never going to save us. Some people said that the law was like an x-ray machine. It just showed us where we were sinning. And, and you can't really argue with that. But because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So the, the law is an x-ray machine or as a vehicle that shows us where we've fallen short. It's a good thing. But remember, the law was never intended for us to try to earn God's goodness or his, uh, his uh, favor, his righteousness and his, uh, his forgiveness. It didn't work that way. That's not what the law was for. It was there just to point us to a holy God to show us how far short we actually fell. And only when Jesus Christ came as the son of God here on earth where he lived that perfect life and then was able to take all of our sins upon himself, did he become that final sacrifice so we didn't need to sacrifice anymore as was the case in the Old Testament. So, you know, Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. So, so Jesus had a healthy respect for the law. But again, he understood his place, which was to be the fulfillment of the law, to be the fulfillment of the prophecy. Amen. He came as God's answer for our sins and our separation. So the other thing I wanted to say real quick was the law, in a sense, if, if we look at the law, and this is and this is why I think it's important for Christians to understand. And I'm talking mostly to Christians here tonight. If you look at the law, or or if you even take parts of the law into your own Christian lifestyle, whatever it might be, and I could I could tell you some things. And like I said, I'm not perfect, but I'm just telling you things that I have noticed. If you're taking components of the law in any way, shape, or form, and trying to hold that up as Okay, God, look how good I'm doing. And you may not even be constantly thinking that's what you're saying, but you're you're practicing the law. You're now back under the law. Well, guess what? That's not grace. And so the law is never going to bring us into that relationship with God. It's only through Jesus Christ now that we find that relationship. I go back to John 14, 6, our scripture memory verse from a couple weeks ago. Jesus said it, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So all of these verses, they all come together. All of those scriptures that we read through the Old Testament, and even, of course, in the New Testament, they all point to this whole idea of grace, that God loves us. He forgives us. There are consequences, however, for what we do that are opposed to what God wants us to do. In other words, if we sin, there's 
typically going to be a consequence, but God will oftentimes use those consequences to give us something even better. And, 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 and he'll, he'll not always uh, um, punish us in such a way that it's just going to be uh, devastating. It's always, any punishment that God gives us is always meant to bring us back into that relationship with him. God never punishes us out of anger or out of disgust or out of just giving up on us. He, he punishes us if, if that is the case where there's some consequences for what we do as a means to bring us back to him. So one of the issues, again, right now in our society is people just don't want to own up to their sins, to their own faults, to their own mistakes. And it's getting to be more and more that way. And you know what? God's standard isn't going to change for our culture. It ain't going to change for the cultures to come, period. It is, it is, I can assure you of that. He, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So God's standards aren't going to change. If we think we can take God's standards and kind of massage them and mold them into what our society is telling us today ain't going to happen. So, so we have to abide by what God is telling us to do. There's plenty of evidence around us that show us why, and that shows us the importance for following Christ, right? Now we just got to do it. We just got to say, we're going to, we're going to make that, that decision. So there's a, a, a willful decision. God gave us a free will when he created us in his image. See, God had a free will. His free will is to give us a free will because we're made in his image. And with that free will now, we are given the opportunity to follow Christ, to get into that relationship with God. But it has to be our choice. You know, you can say, well, I grew up in a church family. Well, that doesn't make you a Christian, whether you grew up in a church family or not. You may have grown up in a family that never went to church and be the strongest Christian out there. So th that doesn't matter. There are no grandchildren in heaven. We all have to have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, plain and simple. And we have to make that our own. We have to choose to do that. So let's keep going here. We'll wrap this up here in the next few minutes. The law shows us our sin and the wrath of God. We've just said that, right? The gospel shows us our Savior and brings God's grace and favor to us. That was the other thing I was going to mention. When we are using the law in any way, shape, or form, as I was getting at a minute ago, that to me is, is getting to that point where we're, we're getting close to trying to work our way up to God, and that's religion. When we do religious things, no matter what they are, especially things that are more of an outward symbol, we are now trying to work our way back up to God. That ain't how it works. That's not grace. That's the law. Grace is God reaching down to us, and he initiates that relationship. And we're freed up from having to do things. If you do certain things out of, the, out of a sincere heart and not out of some form of obligation or compulsion or thinking you've got to do it, or to punish yourself for your sins that you've done. You know, if you do something because that's what you believe is a way to express your faith and to deepen your faith with Christ, then that's probably a different story. It's when we do things that are designed to get us into that relationship with God. If we if we if we pray often enough, if we if we sacrifice often enough, if we do these rituals often enough, and we believe those are going to get us into that relationship with God. You know, they may work for a while. I just don't know if they're going to work long term. They might. But again, that's not what's going to get us into the relationship with God. It's all been covered on the cry, on the cross. So everything was done on the cross. Anything beyond that is religion. And, and you know, we didn't come here to be religious. We came to have a relationship with Christ. That's, that's why we've come into this thing called the church. The church is a body of believers who have, by faith, received Jesus Christ into their hearts. And through that, now we receive the goodness of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the love of God, the forgiveness of God. All of these things come to us simply by faith in Christ. The law must be proclaimed to all people, but especially to sinners who refuse to repent. The gospel may be proclaimed to sinners who are troubled by their sin. The gospel must be proclaimed to sinners who are troubled by their sins. So let me read this again. This, this is a topic we may have to discuss another time. I want to read this real closely, so you make sure you follow this. This, this is what this says, again, from my uh, catechism app here, again, from the Lutheran tradition. The law must be pr proclaimed to all people, but especially to sinners who refuse to repent. Now, I will just say this. If you go up to somebody today and tell them how bad they are, what a sinner they are, make sure you're not the same kind of sinner yourself. You, you need to make sure that when you are confronting somebody about a particular sin, 
that you're doing it in accordance with the scriptural admonitions on how to do it. And certainly we don't want to do it in a judgmental fashion and we don't want to do it in a condemning way. But I do believe we, need to con we do need to call each other into accountability. And there may be a time where we need to hold the line on what we consider to be sin. So our, our, our society doesn't really like to talk about sin. A lot of churches don't like to talk about sin. So we just sort of let it go and everything is okay. Remember, like we said the other day, you know, the, the old book that came out in the early 70s, I'm okay, you're okay. Well, the, the, the better book probably would have been, I'm not okay and you're not okay, because that's really the reality. We're all messed up people and we all need a savior. That's really the bottom line. So, so, so if we come to someone in, in, in the spirit where we're trying to maybe lead them and show them the, the, the law of God, let's say, it needs to be done in a, in a, in a uh, spirit of love and concern and compassion. And again, I would really pray about how to do that because what you could end up doing is just chasing somebody away. Let God do the convicting. We don't have to sit there and convict people of what they did. My goodness, you know, until I've sat there and gone through everything I've done, uh, I don't think I'd have any time to, uh, there'll be any time left for me to stand around and try to criticize and uh, correct a lot of other people. And that doesn't mean we can't have discussions with them. I believe we can. We can have conversations. We have that relationship. We can talk about a lot of things. But I believe that's where it really begins. If you stand out on the street corner at 7th and Kansas Avenue and hold the Bible over your head, you know, and you're going to just tell everybody how bad they are and all the sins they've done, it's probably not going to be really effective at bringing people into the kingdom of God, quite honestly, especially in today's culture. Today's uh, particular societal norms would not really go well with that. You know, you might catch one or two people, but you might not. You might chase them all away. So here's the deal. Show them love, show them compassion, show them grace. If you do get into discussions about what does the law say, especially if it's a problem area, be careful who you do it to. It would be my suggestion. And do it to somebody with whom you already have a relationship or unless the Holy Spirit says, you go talk to this person right now. But do it in love. It's always got to be done in love. Amen. So we can talk about this one again. Uh, the gospel must be proclaimed to sinners who are troubled by their sins. So, to me, the grace of God is available to all people. Yes, it does help, like we said a minute ago, if we are aware of our sins, if we're conscious of our mistakes, if we're conscious of how we have done things that are disobedient to God. But, you know, again, we have to meet people where they're at. They may not even know there is a God in this, again, in our world today. We have to introduce them to the Lord as best we can through the guidance and the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's really the way to do it. And again, until we do have a relationship with people, I believe that's difficult. You know, once we have a relationship, and it could be something very casual. It could be somebody on your uh, child's basketball team or your grandchild's baseball team. You know, it could be anybody that you might even know casually. And you just start striking up a conversation with them and see where it takes you. But, you know, but you can always bring up spiritual things. You know, you can you can tell them a little bit about your life and you could even just turn the, the, the questions over. Hey, do you go to church anywhere? You know, just see where that leads. It, it doesn't have to be a the four spiritual laws, you know, that people used to memorize. And, and, and I'm not saying those are all bad either, but, you know, the, 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 the concept is good. But I think we need to do it in such a way that it meets individuals where they're at. So I'm not disputing what it says here, but I'm just saying that we, I believe, are compelled when we share what God's law teaches as well as about the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of, and the love of, of God through Christ we are always probably going to be more effective in sharing that when we have a relationship with somebody. Amen. So, so just pray about it. I know there's people in my life that I'd like to talk to that I, I mean, just pray for the opportunity. I, I hope it comes up. You know, I would like to do it like I am today. I'm, I'm kind of wearing a sweatshirt and sweatpants. I would like to do it in a, in a casual way, not like I'm all tight. And, you know, I think we just have to learn how to share our faith with people. In, in a very conversational, non-threatening way. I think people will be much more receptive to that. And then we're almost done here. Let's let's look here. It's a, a, about three verses, okay? Then we're going to call it. Romans 3.20, it says, For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, in God's sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So in other words, we're not going to be justified by God through knowledge of the law. All that did was show us what sin is, which we've already said. So John six sixty three says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. 
the words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. And then Romans 1, 6, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So, we're stopped there. It's a little after 6.30. I went on a little bit longer. Sorry if I preached a little bit, but sometimes I can't help it because I just believe it's so important to just share what's going on. We, uh, we're working out our, you know, the Bible says work out your own salvation. It doesn't mean work for your salvation. It means work it out. I feel like uh, I could probably spend a lot more time in God's word than what I do. There's, there are days I'm just tired. I'll be, I'll be honest with you. And, and yet I find that that is the, the one thing, the one constant in my life, spiritually speaking, that just keeps me going is the word of God. I love, like I said, I love my devotionals. I love, there's one here on this. If I can find this, I'll just show you. This is a uh, small app that's called uh, Live Bold. It says the app for Christian men. I don't know if you can see that. I'll tell you what, this is one of the best little apps and, and because it has what's on here, Daily Kickstart. And what I love about this is this is how long it is. I don't know if you can see that. It's 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 like two paragraphs. I mean, it is right on. You talk about uplifting, motivating, challenging, but it's always done with a positive element to it. And I think that's what people want. Um, be you know, present the truth of the gospel, but do it in a positive way. We all have the same needs. We're not trying to sell somebody anything. We're just letting them know that God's love through Jesus Christ is available to them. They have to make the choice. You know, the old saying from years ago was um, that being a Christian or getting to know Jesus is just like one beggar telling the other beggar where to find bread. We've all fallen short. We're all standing on level ground at the foot of the cross. Nobody's standing up any higher than anybody else. I mean, I'm, I'm down there as probably lower than some and, and, and maybe lower than most. So um, maybe I'm the lowest even. Who knows? God knows. But you know what? At the foot of the cross, we're all level because we've all sinned. And so we don't need to sit here and say, well, I'm a worse sinner than you. And you start having a contest. Who's the worst sinner? It's not what it's about. It's knowing that Christ loves us that much, that he died for us and he's forgiven us. Now we have this relationship with him through grace. And that's what the gospel is all about. It's good news. That's what the gospel means is the good news. So we have good news to share with our friends, our neighbors, our relatives, our co-workers, people we meet on the streets, people we don't even know. When we get the opportunity, be ready to give them the reason for the hope that is in you and that is found through Jesus Christ. Amen. So we'll go ahead and call it for tonight. Thank you again for joining me and being with me. This went a little longer, but you know what? I just felt like the Spirit was, was speaking here, so hopefully it will be something that will be beneficial to you. Look forward to seeing you back on uh, Sunday morning at about 9.45 for Sunday school, 10.30 for our worship service, and we'll do our scripture memory class about 11.30 or thereabouts. So do be, or actually more like 11.15. So we're, we're trying to get all that done within an hour time frame so we don't keep people uh, going uh, back and forth with <laughs> Facebook. Although I, I love to do it, but this way it just sort of keeps, I think, more people in the mix. And we may be doing a few little more uh, Facebook Live things from time to time. These two minute with Pastor Phil segments are coming up. We're just going to do those as the Holy Spirit leads. So, uh, again, uh, be looking for those as well. So, I wish you a good Thursday night. Stay safe, stay warm. Hope your pipes don't freeze. Hope our pipes don't freeze for that matter. They did freeze the other night, but I think we got them on. Un... You know what? It's funny. People say uh, we, we, we got them unthawed. Well, that means you froze them again. You didn't unthaw them. You, you thawed them. So we thawed that. We got the pipes thawed out. I always say we, we got them unthawed. We got them unfrozen. We did not get them unthawed. Anyway, that's another story for the other day. You all have a good night. God bless you. We'll talk to you soon.